Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack coming <laughs> coming again live from the uh, Gillingham branch of the History Hack Empire. I have uh, James McManus with me today, who is a writer and a journalist who has been uh, the foreign correspondent in, for The Guardian in France, Africa and the Middle East, and is uh, currently uh, director of the Times Literary Supplement. Uh, managing, previous, director, yeah. Yeah. managing director, yeah, sorry. <laughs> managing director of the Times Literary Supplement. His previous books include uh, On the Broken Shore, Black Venus, Sleep in Peace Tonight, and Midnight in Berlin. And he's here today to talk about his new book, uh, Love in the Lost Land. Uh, James, welcome to History Hack. How are you doing? Thank you very much. I'm doing well, thank you, and pleased to be on your show. Love in the Lost Land is uh, set in South Africa, isn't it? It's set in Rhodesia, actually, and it draws very heavily on my experiences there when I was the Guardian's Africa correspondent in the years 1974 to 1980, which was, of course, the years of war in Rhodesia, as it was then called, which mm. led to the independence and the creation of Zimbabwe. So roll back just before that, but what was the state of Rhodesia before, before it did declare independence? Rhodesia declared independence, UDI, in 1965. And before that, there were three sort of wilderness years because it had been part of the Central African Federation, which had been put together by Britain uh, after the Second World War. And that was a federation of Southern Rhodesia, Northern Rhodesia, and Nyasaland. Northern Rhodesia is now Zambia, and Nyasaland is now Malawi. What Britain hoped to do was to create a trading bloc in the middle of Africa for the mutual benefit or benefit of all the peoples there. Um, and hoped in that way to retain some sort of control. But, of course, two huge forces came into play against this. One was the newly uh, independent African colonies like Ghana, which saw this as just an extension of colonialism, which in a sense it was. And then there was Southern Rhodesia, which became Rhodesia itself, uh, which didn't want to be linked uh, with the uh, largely black African countries to the north, um, i.e. what became Zambia and Malawi. So... The Federation fell, and in 1963, it was dissolved. Um, the, as I said, there were then a couple of years in which both all those three countries sort of ruled themselves. Zambia and uh, Malawi came went on to independence, and Rhodesia went on, southern Rhodesia was technically called, to uh, a, a self-declared independence, the UDI, in 1965. And that's what set in train all the violence, the war, and the desolation of a great country ever after. Yeah, yeah. Um, the UK didn't react well to the uh, self-declaration of independence, did they? Well, no, but they knew it was coming. They had very good intelligence about what Ian Smith was going to do. It was hardly a surprise. The problem for Harold Wilson's, Wilson's government was that they couldn't do anything about it. The one thing they couldn't do was use military force against um, the Rhodesians, who were pretty well armed and well motivated, had a good, strong young army. And there was no way we could uh, em deploy troops in Central Africa to take them on. And there was a question about the actual loyalty of the troops on both sides, because um, there was a lot of, you know, uh, popular feeling that Ian Smith uh, had taken the right decision not to acquiesce in black African majority rule. There was a, there were very strong feelings towards having sort of black African control of things. We still got you have apartheid in South Africa, and there was still very much them and us between the white and black communities, wasn't there? Yes, but don't forget that Harold McMillan, McMillan went prime minister in 1958 that early and gave the great speech in Cape Town talking about the wind of change blowing through Africa. Mm. And by the uh, early 60s, Ghana, as I said, had become independent. Kenya was well on the way to becoming uh, independent too, which it did very early in the 1960s. And other countries like Tanzania, Zambia, Malawi were clearly going to follow. So the the, the huge sea change in, in Africa was taking place, and nobody thought that that could be stopped. And indeed, most people of any sense didn't want it to be stopped. It was the inevitable progress of history. 
So um, the them and us answer sort of thing is there. Racism is there at every step of the way that you talk about Rhodesia. But it is not the case that Britain didn't actually help uh, and acquiesce in the independence of its former colonies in Africa. It did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, my grandfather went out to Ghana as a as a civil engineer to help uh, you are. put the infrastructure in for independence. Um, was, and the government paid him very, very well for that. Good. Back, back in the days. Back in the day, yeah. With the with the declaration, you end up with uh, the Rhodesian Bush War, don't you? It's a bit more than a Bush War, and yeah. you, you can uh, argue about when it actually started. I got to Rhodesia in December 1974, when the imprisoned nationalists, Joshua Nkomo, Robert Mugabe, were released in order to facilitate peace talks. This is very much under the uh, under pressure from South Africa, Britain, and America. So Ian Smith had to had to accept that. Mm-hmm. And the war hadn't truly started then. It was described and viewed by the Rhodesians as a police action against criminal elements. Um, they didn't describe it as a, a war at all, in order not to alarm the minority population. Um, but following the breakdown of those talks I've just mentioned, that's when the war really started. And that's when both Nkomo and Mugabe realized or said that negotiation was not going to be the way to independence. It had to be by force of arms. Uh, the nationalists use guerrilla warfare, don't they? Sort of hit and fade from the, from the jungle. Uh, yeah, there's no jungle in Rhodesia. It's bush. Uh, it's, no, uh, it's, it's well below the jungle belt in Africa. Um, but the point is, yes, the only way the, two, the twin nationalist forces of Joshua Nkomo and Robert Mugabe who I may say were as much opposed to each other as they were to Ian Smith, uh, could operate in that territory was fire, infiltrating people into the bush, attacking farms, lonely kind of outposts and villages, and so forth. Uh, that is guerrilla warfare, yeah. Mm. Um, where, where did they get the recruits from? There were plenty of recruits. I mean, there's been a, a, a steady a departure, emigration, illegal mostly, of young black African men into the um, organizations run by uh, Mugabe and, and Nkomo. It wasn't actually Mugabe then, I should say. It was uh, Dominique Satoli, but he was replaced. Um, there was no problem with recruits ever. There were plenty of young men prepared to go and fight for their country, leave the border illegally. Um, and there was a huge diaspora anyway of, of uh, black Zimbabweans or black Rhodesians, if you like, who would left the country. So that wasn't a problem. And how did the? I mean, you said that they were attacking like isolated um, farmsteads and things. How how did this affect the civilians in general? Uh, well, a very good question. It actually started. You can go back to 1968 when the first sort of farm attacks happened. Uh, the infiltration across the Zambezi was quickly stopped, and and um, and the 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 guerrillas caught and prison some uh, some executed. I think. Um, and that was when the Rhodesians insisted this was a police action. After 1974, it got a great deal more serious. Uh, so I've forgotten your question at all. This: How did they react to uh, the Rhodesians? Uh, how, did, how did the civilian? Um, how did it affect the civilians? Well, the Rhodesian propaganda machine was very good, and it was very effective. Um, occasionally, farmers up in the northeast of the country, uh, around Mount Darwin would be attacked, and this is all put down to, as I say, bandits and irregulars, and it was never described as a war. Um, and one shouldn't forget that while the guerrillas were using the bush and then a sort of natural sea in which they swam, i.e. the local villagers, the Rhodesian forces, too, were very good at bush warfare, and they, too, had the, uh, um, could cajole or, or uh, you know persuade people to help them in the bush. So this wasn't just a war by conventional so- uh, conventional forces on one side and guerrillas on the other. It was very much a battle fought out in the bush. And how did the, I don't know if this is a separate question or not, but how did the white, small white population in Rhodesia deal with the war? Well, yeah, th- that's a question which I actually haven't answered last time, so let me do so now. Yeah. Initially, there was, and I was there from the very early months, December 1974, there's a sort of gung-ho attitude that we can see this through. This is only um, a bunch of guerrillas. And don't forget, at that stage, the Portuguese empire was still extant. It was still uh, holding. Therefore, uh, Angola and Mozambique, Mozambique being on Rhodesia's eastern borders, were still under Portuguese military control, which made it much easier 
for the Rhodesians to close the infiltration routes by Zandler, as Mugabe's regulars are called, from, um, from Zambia. Once the coup happened on the April the 24th uh, in 1974, then that all ended. In fact, I'm jumping ahead of myself here because the coup had already happened by the end of, that, of 1974. Uh, and that greatly complicated the Rhodesian security force operations. What were your experiences as a journalist in the country during during the war? Well, to start with, I had a golden or an iron rule, if you like, which I had to be even handed. Mm. I was working for the Guardian newspaper, which was a newspaper, of course, highly opposed to what was called a rebel racist regime, which it was. It was rebel and it was racist and it was headed by a supreme racist, if you like, Ian Smith. Mm. But I reported, and I did so even handedly without injecting comment into my news stories, um, what the government was doing or trying to do, particularly when it came down to negotiations with the nationalists, which were going on pretty much all the time, secretly. And I tried to be even handed in terms of describing the guerrilla warfare in the bush, which of which, of course, we could see almost nothing. Because in those early uh, months of 1974, um, there was very little activity except at night. Some of the roads began to be mined and ambushed, but very far from town. Mm -hmm. And we were dissuaded by any, in any case by the Rhodesian authorities not to go anywhere near um, the operational areas, as it was called, because they didn't want j dead Western journalists on their hands, obviously. Yeah. So they, they did not facilitate our um, observation of the war at all. We went out to the farms and we went out to the mission stations and, and that's how we got information about what was happening. And it became clear in 1974 that what was happening was going very much against the government forces. In other words, the local population was sort of 70 or 80 percent, if you like, for the guerrilla forces. Did you find it sort of difficult that because you, as a journalist, as you said, you, were, you had to be neutral and even handed, but there were there would be events and things that as a human being, you'd want to get involved in, but you, you, you couldn't because you had to stay impartial. Well, impartiality is a very good sort of question. There are many journalists there who are openly uh, not impartial, but openly committed to one side or the other. They didn't last long under the Rhodesian regime um, if they just used their presence there as a platform for propaganda against that government. Uh, I, the difficulties came when we were talking to the white farmers and their families. And here were people living behind barbed wire fences with mines buried into their gardens, with grenade screens over their windows, with rifles at the ready by their bedsides at night, with young children. And they employed a lot of people, a lot of African uh, workers who were paid, not wonderfully well, but were paid. Hmm. And um, one small farm would have about 60 or 70 workers and they would get the crops in and they would be given food and uh, uh, small uh, medical services, etc. Now, that is an emotional situation when you come to hear the argument that we are doing better for the rural population than anywhere else you see in the newly independent nations of Africa. Because, mm. of course, corruption became the absolute hallmark of the independent countries north of the Zambezi. And to some extent, you could say yes. The other argument was that we have been here for three or four generations. We have built this country up. We put in the roads, the dams, the railways, and we deserve some sort of recognition from what we've given the majority population, which is a much more modern country technologically than those around us. That was also true. Mm. So it wasn't just that we had this black-white divide where um, uh, every white person in Medicia was a fanatical racist. Uh, determined to keep his boot on the neck of the of the black, or that every black person there was a fanatical reverse racist, if you like, who hated the whites. Um, I've I've said this in my book, and I do hope we can discuss that shortly. Yeah. That the war would have been over in a week had the African population of Rhodesia, uh, which was six million, stopped work for ten days. There were six million Africans there and a quarter of a million whites. The Africans underpinned the economy. So it's not just the rural economy and the farms, but in the, in the hotels, the cafes, they were in the police, they were in the special forces, they were in, there was two battalions of Royal African, uh, British African Rifles. This was all populated by black African Zimbabweans, or Rhodesians, if you call them. Had they just downed tools, the country would have come to a stop. The war would have been won. 
But there was a sort of residual loyalty to what had been built up there. And it may have been unconscious. It may just have been, let's, you know, it's very hard to describe. But that, uh, that made reporting on that story more complicated because they're trying to explain that to a, an audience in London or America or wherever who wanted to see this in purely black and white terms and wanted just good and bad, evil and, and good. Um, it was quite difficult to do that, but there were no moral absolutes in Medusa when I was reporting there. Yeah, and I suppose as well with the with the sort of the white farmers as well, if they've been because the, obviously they've been there for generations, this is their home as well. You know, it's not it's not like they're fresh fresh invaders or fresh interlopers of they've just moved into the homestead. That that land could have been exactly. within the family decades or a century. That, listen, that's absolutely true, uh, but it's equally true that a lot of the white population of Odisha, when I got there, were people whose families had come in after World War II, seeking sunshine, servants, a good way of living. Mm. And a lot of those people have been RAF who trained in uh, southern Odisha, was it then called, um, trained in, in Odisha during the war, where they were sent out there to train on the plains because it was a beautiful climate and long hours of sunlight. Uh, and so they came back to Britain after the war, knowing that that was there, the sun, the beautiful country, and cheap labour, basically. And cheap labour was, of course, very important to these families. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get on to the, onto the topic of your book. So let's get to the, the topic of your book, uh, Love in a Lost Land. Tell us about it. Well, this is the um, seventh novel I've written, and it's the one that's been waiting to be written for 40, 50 years. Because the years that I spent in Rhodesia for the Guardian, 74 to 80, were the most exciting years of my life. And the memories of those years and the experiences I had in those years and the loves that I had and lost in those years have formed a sort of a, a collection of memories that refuse to be forgotten. And the only way to really to deal with this and to sort of exorcise what I felt so deeply then, or at least make a record of it, is to write a book. And that book I wanted to be a novel, drawing very heavily on my experiences at the time, because I thought that was an easier way to tell the story. It's not a story of Rhodesia, it's a story of a love affair at a time of war. Obviously, yeah, okay. it is of Rhodesia, although I don't name the country in this book, but anyone with the slightest history of Africa knows that. And it includes people I knew quite well, under false names, of course, black, white, and uh, male, female, every which way. Um, and I think at the at the back of the book, I do pay tribute to uh, many of the people in memoriam who are no longer with us, Africans and Sudetians and foreigners, um, for the role they played in the country. Is that, no, sorry, that answer the question? I'm, quite, I'm not quite sure if it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good general overview of the book. What kind of experiences did you feel moved the most to talk about Look, when I got to Odisha, I did so as a complete innocent. Mm. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing there. I'd driven up from Mozambique with a couple of journalists. I was let into the border, even though I was a guardian journalist, because they didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> and the only advice I got when I got there was hire a car, it's in the book, this, and drive out of town and see where you get to. And I did that. And where I got to was uh, uh, a little town called Shamba in which there was a country club for white people, of course. Mm. And in that country club was a rather strange drunk farmer called John Morkel, who took me back to his farm for lunch. And there I met the family, his wife, his daughter, and um, and some neighbors. And those formed the nucleus of the people I sort of describe in the book, because um, if this is a book as much about love, sex, passion, if you like, as anything else, although there are plenty of accounts of how the war was actually fought. And those accounts are based very much on what I saw, what I heard, and what I know happened. But to go back to my theme, the love story at the heart of this book is what was at the time an absolutely outrageous one. How can a white visiting journalist have an affair with a black African township teacher at a mm -hmm. time of war when the country is fighting for, well, British was fighting for its illegal independence, and the Nationalists were fighting for their legal in, in their legal dependent, independence. How could that happen? Well, it did happen. Because that, that would have been really quite taboo, wouldn't it? 
Well, yes, but one should be a bit careful about Rhodesia. It wasn't apartheid as there was in South Africa. There were hotels, restaurants, cafes in which you could freely mix with African uh, people. And there was a sort of small, tiny professional class of Africans there. But the journalists had the sort of, were sacrosanct and they had their own watering hole where they gathered. It was in the Ambassador Club. It was called the Quill Club. I've translated that into the Pinks Club in the, in the, in the book, the Pen and Ink Club, shortened to Pinks. And that's where you were liable to meet, as I did, this woman, Patience. Actually, I met her elsewhere, but never mind. Um, or a black journalist or whatever else, as anyone else. Hmm. And that was the place where the gossip was exchanged and the spooks went in to watch us all and we watched them and so on and so forth. Uh, and it was only one sordid room, and that is described quite closely with some detail in my book. But in that room, so much happens in this book because so much is revealed about the characters that I betray. Hmm. Portrait, sorry. When you say spooks, were they the, government, the Rhodesian government agents? Uh, spies. I mean, they, not just the Rhodesians, the American CIA had people there. The British MI6 had people there. I'm quite sure the Russians and the, everyone else did as well. Um, no, it was a, the center of international attention in the 70s because uh, Rhodesia was always seen as a gateway by the black African nations to South Africa. South mm-hmm. Africa equally saw that and wished to defend themselves against that. America wanted the chrome that only Rhodesia produced at that quality. And Britain just wanted to get shot at the whole thing. So there's a lot of uh, attention paid to this small uh, country with what was relatively a small but very, very brutal Bush war. Usually that sort of, I suppose during the Cold War period, there was uh, every every little sort of bushfire needed to be looked at by the international community to see what they could get out of it and whether they could get strategic one-upmanship on the other side. Absolutely, absolutely. Because uh, if, if the Americans were there, as you said, you can bet the, the Russians were there as well. <laughs> of course, yeah, of course. So I mentioned in, in the press release for this, that this is quite a, I hesitate to use the word forgotten war, but it's it's not one that's readily remembered by a lot of people. No, uh, if I can ju- jump in. No, it is a forgotten war. It's never mm-hmm. really f- found its big historian. And one of the reasons that it's forgotten is Robert Mugabe. Yes. Because what Mugabe did after independence was turn the hopes that we all had into ashes in our hands and made many people say, well, the African population, certainly in the rural areas, were better off under Rhodesian, white Rhodesian rule than this. Mm. So a lot of people have sort of turned their backs on the whole conflict and don't want to know about it. And I sort of understand that. But Mugabe, I met Mugabe in uh, December 1974. When, he, when he'd been released from prison. And mm. he was cold, calculating, difficult certainly to get to know. And although I saw a lot of him in the years of exile in the 70s, I, I don't think I ever did get to know him. And I suspect that's true of many other people. Mm. Um, but he was also, he became a pragmatist, a, a pragmatist after independence when Samora Michelle of Mozambique and Julius Nereri of Tanzania told him that he had inherited a jewel in Africa, and that he was to keep the white farmers on the farms, put into the agricultural ministry the previous white minister, Dennis Norman, and so on and so forth. And he did do that. Um, what followed, though, very, very quickly in 12 months was the ghastly genocide almost that was unleashed upon the Holocaust on the Indibeli people in the southwest of the country hmm. and Untold thousands were slaughtered, men, women, and children, in the name of security, because Mugabe thought that uh, Joshua and Comey's people were planning a kind of coup, which is not entirely unfeasible, but probably not, not, not real. No, no. Um, were, were you there for the? Were you there during during that that period? No, I left after independence. I went to the Middle East, um, yeah. but I know so many people who were there. And shamefully, the British government and other international agencies uh, uh, ignored what was happening in the South, Southwest, ignored the kind of Holocaust of rape and, and, and murder, because they all wanted to get on with Mugabe. We all thought Mugabe was the man. And OK, this is a tribal. It was a tribal warfare. This. There's no other way to describe it. And this was Africa. So let's just forget about it and get on with helping Mugabe create a really prosperous country. And the prosperity of, of of Zimbabwe was supposed to be a beacon to South Africa 
that if they went down this road to independent to proper sort of a majority rule, they wouldn't all suffer the fate of you know what happened in the Congo when all the whites were massacred. Um, that turned to ashes, as I said, into everyone's hands very quickly, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, because um, Rhodesia, uh, Zimbabwe was always uh, sort of referred to as sort of the breadbasket of uh, Southern Africa, wasn't it? And it was uh, it was an extraordinarily prosperous um, country with huge farming potential, which have been realised. Very big mineral deposits, massive tourist potential too, with the Victoria Falls, the Lake Kariba. Um, an amazing country in every respect. It could have fed half of Africa and could do. It could have still done so now, but. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Mugabe misrule has been continued. Yeah, they. Um, I remember seeing it on the news. Seeing on the news that they had sort of nineteen thirty style German inflation that a, a thousand, uh, like a, a a million Zimbabwe dollars could buy you yeah. one banana or something, yeah. and it was just horrendous. So, uh, the tragedy now, as I said, is that the rural population in Zimbabwe are not much better off than they were during the war in the seventies when they were caught in the crossfire between both sides. Mm. And, say, looking at things like infant mortality rates and, uh, and early deaths from a range of pretty simple diseases to cope with, like malaria, are huge now. So um, it, it is a tragedy. It's a genuine tragedy. And, and um, there's not a lot that the Western world can do about it, really. No, no. And um, there's probably kind of almost a lack of interest of the Western powers to do anything as well, because everyone's sort of, there's always that kind of, oh, well, we could help, but what's in it for us? Um, or maybe I'm just... Uh... <laughs> no, that's a bit cynical, I think. To yeah. be uh, they've just gone through an election in uh, Zimbabwe, which, needless to say, was not a fair election, but the government is clever enough under President Mnangagwa to allow the opposition having beaten them up and deprived them of voting rights and the else, to have a sort of minority vote so they can say to the world, well, come on, this was a fair vote, to democracy. It isn't. Um, the Western powers have done what they can in mm. terms of not so much sanctions, but, yeah, you know, sanctions, I think, would be the way, the way we put on things. Um, but it's, you know, down south, you see South Africa sliding slowly into chaos. Mm. Um, Zimbabwe is already there. If you happen to have foreign currency in Zimbabwe, you can have quite a nice lifestyle. The steaks and the restaurants are there, flown up from South Africa, and the hotels are staffed and so on and so forth. Um, but without foreign currency, you are doomed um, to starvation, basically. I'm not sure if we've already sort of answered this before, but so why should this war be remembered now? Well, I remember it for personal reasons, if you like, because I wanted to place on the record what, um, in this case, a magazine writer found uh, in Rhodesia in the 70s during a time of increasing war. I wanted to try and explain the complexities and the pain and the pleasures of an interracial relationship based very much on what happened to me and to ex put that in the context of this war. And I therefore wanted to take the reader of this book, and I hope they buy and read it because they'll love it. It's a very fast-moving narrative, into that situation. Mm. Now, your question, sorry, I've now forgotten what your question was. <laughs> as a, as a, uh, why should the war be remembered? Well, all wars should be remembered because if we don't remember them, we don't learn from them. Now, you can argue that the human beings never learn from any war anyway. I mean, look at the First World War, and then we did it all over again 20 years later. Yeah. Um, but until we remember quite what happened and why, there's no possibility, of course, of learning. The lessons of of, uh, of the Rhodesian War are almost those of the war in Ukraine. The sheer mm -hmm. stupidity of the minority white population thinking that they could fight a war with a minority with a majority of six million African population around them and achieve what? What were they going to achieve? No one could ever answer that question when I asked them when I was down there in what was then Salisbury. Fight on forever against a kind of a, a growing army of guerrillas outside their borders. It was crazy. Yeah. And as I said, the African population too could have stopped that war simply by downing tools for, for a week. Okay, they wouldn't have had much food, but they would have stopped it. So 
And if you look back at Ukraine, you can, or look at Ukraine today, you can see the sheer insanity of a war, which Putin knows he can't win, just as Zelensky on the Ukrainian side knows he is never going to ultimately triumph over Russia and restore sovereignty over uh, Crimea. It isn't going to happen. We all know that. There's going yeah, to be yeah. a deal done. Sorry, I'm without branching off a little bit. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, yeah, I mean, there are there are so many conflicts that have just fallen by the wayside in 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 memory and popular, especially in popular memory. Um, like the the Second Boer War is one of my pet subjects, and you sort of mention it to people, and they just sort of a what the Second War. Um, anything that's I'm not. Sure, I've got a button. I'm not sure that's entirely true because. Any publisher will tell you, any um, agent will tell you, literally, that a book about the Second World War sells. Oh, be it, war. Sorry? Sorry, Second Boer War. The Second World War. Like, Boer, Boer War. Uh, South Africa. You're talking about the Second Boer War? Yeah, 1899 to 1900. Oh, sorry. Well, no, that's long gone. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yes. yes sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, World War II. We'll never get away from that. <laughs> um, yeah, you're right. But yeah, things like the second second Boer, Boer War. Um, it's you talk to people about it, and there's that kind of glazed. Sorry, what? Um, and, well, exactly because nobody knows when it was and what it was, basically. But you're quite right. But I mean, I'm not sure that is is likely to be imprinted on the public consciousness quite as other major sort of uh, conflict. You know, I mean, yeah, that's what I mean. That sort of time has gone on. You know, um, up until the First World War, it's like oh, you remember the, the war in South Africa. And then after the First World War, it's quickly forgotten because <laughs> the First World War was so much bigger. Yeah, but um, exactly. there, there, there's lots of sort of post, like the Malaya emergency, I suppose, will be a good comparison to what was going on in Rhodesia. It's um, it's not really well spoken about that much. No, it's attracted the artists. The trouble is, it, Rhodesia has not attracted. A, it's got plenty of books about it. Uh, one or two rather good ones, but there's no overall com comprehensive sort of history of the post-UDI period in Rhodesian history, which mm. very quickly led to a Bush war and to independence. There's not that, that book is not there. I mean, uh, hope, hopefully your book encouraged someone to, because often through popular culture or pop, you know, sort of fiction, people go, actually, this is really interesting. I want to go away and uh, find out more about it, and it might encourage or inspire someone to go and write to actually to write this as well. Absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Something I, I definitely when when uh, we got the email from the publisher, like there was a war in Rhodesia, so I had to go away and quickly try and get a rough idea what what happened and who, who yeah. the major players were and things. I know, but you remember Ian Smith, don't you? Wasn't he a name that stands out? Yes, it was. It was a, a gray, a gray brain cell at the back of my head remembered something from school about it. Is the name rang a bell? Yeah, but I couldn't place much detail on him. It was something from about thirty odd years ago in the back of my head, saying, "Oh yeah, you've heard of that guy," and that was yeah. it. But um, what, what happened to him in the end? He stayed on after independence, and initially independence went well. And he was asked what he felt, and he said, "I'm, well, I'm completely surprised." He had tea with Mugabe actually, which was pretty amazing. Mm. And then, of course, it all fell apart. And he then said, "I told you so." <laughs> He'd always said, "Never majority rule in a thousand years," and he said, "That's what happens." And this is the terrifying thing about the uh, Zimbabwe: it's enabled every white racist anywhere in the world to say, "Well, that's what you get." If you yeah. uh, accede to the demands in Africa and elsewhere, um, by a people not prepared for to, to rule for majority rule, so it gave the racists a huge sort of you know argument, and he was one of them. Yeah, yeah, they're very very quick to grab onto <laughs> onto the first time it goes wrong. Go see, we told you exactly. Um, and, and it's probably a bit of a pie in the sky question, but do you do you think there's any chance that that Zimbabwe can can change? Yeah. Look, when the Romans got to Britain, or England as they saw it, mm. in AD, whatever it was, we were running around in rags with woad on our faces. Yeah. And the Romans might well have said to themselves, are these people ever going to civilize themselves and grow up and create a country? Well, time rolls on, the, entry, the centuries pass, and we did. That'll happen in Africa. Yes, of course it yeah. will. Uh, it's just a different uh, time scale. But it would take time. And if you think of the brutalities that we went through in this country 
or in Europe in general, if you like, the, in, in the medieval ages to create a kind of a, a parliamentary democracy here, it's very unfair to suddenly ex expect the African nations after independence to do the same in short order. They can't. Yeah. It's going to take time. Yeah, as you said, uh, I was just trying to think of the time frame, sort of like uh, AD 45, we're all painted blue, and then by sort of 1851, we're on the on the brink of having the largest empire in the world. It's, yeah, uh, that's right. So, Absolutely right. Yeah, it's um, uh, yeah. Uh, I hadn't. Yeah, the time scale is uh, what, what's needed. It is. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is. Uh, but yeah, no, this would be really fascinating. Um, could you uh, remind everyone the the title of your book and uh, when it's out? Yes, indeed. The book is called Love in a Lost Land. It's out on September the fourteenth, priced at ten ninety nine, and uh, much less, of course, on Amazon. Uh, I do urge you to read it, and if you do like it, I think you will, because it's a a first person narrative mm. told by a, um, a a magazine writer who happened to be there at the time. That is in Central Africa in, in Rhodesia, and the story moves swiftly, but it is a love affair. I would stress that as much with a background of war. It's yeah. not vice versa. The love the love story comes first. And I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, and um we'll we'll get it onto our the podcast bookshop as well. Um Thank you. bookstore dot org. So with every sale we get a small amount of the money and you get more money than if it goes through the popular rainforest named website where okay. uh and I, 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 I honestly, I'll be going off to pre-order my copy because um, I think I might, re by the sound of it, I'm going to really enjoy it. I think you will. And I, I really appreciate the conversation too. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.